Hi, this is Brother Richard, and today we're continuing with our lesson series, Prototokos Mystery. This will be part 412, and we're looking at a title of our lesson today, Death of a Non-Adamic Race. <clears throat> Scripture teaches, because of the fall, the human race opened itself up to incarnation by fallen intelligences. Spirits from different locations which previously could not incarnate into the human race, but because of the transgression of man now have a wide open exit into humanity. Genesis 25 Verse Isaac entreats the Lord, petitions the Lord on behalf of his wife. <clears throat> 21, Isaac entreated the Lord for his wife because she was barren, and the Lord was entreated of him, and Rebekah, his wife, conceived. Now, we take a look at what Isaac entreated. Isaac Being the son of Abraham understood this whole aspect of the inheritance. Abraham was promised a son that would receive the inheritance, pass it on down, and ultimately a race would come into existence which would be called the nation of God. So Isaac who was 40 years old when he uh, married Rebecca, has waited 20 years and he has not gotten an, an heir. This is why he entreats the Lord for his wife. He expected one son, just like Abraham expected one son, yes. Brother Jones, I'm gonna cut right in the middle of this lesson because I need this answer. So we know that uh, Abraham's wife didn't, she was barren, yeah. okay? Yeah. And so, and then we know Hagar and Ishmael, and we know, we all, we know that story. And now, so Abraham finally gets his son, Isaac, and now Isaac's wife, she's barren. Why is there so, so much of that scenario keep playing out through Abraham and then now Isaac? Isaac. Luciferian influence. <clears throat> if Abraham has promised a son, <clears throat> it means that that was the Lord's will from never son. Here we're talking about YHVH. Didn't happen for a long, 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 long time. Remember, the enemy has access now to the entrance into the human race. He can shut it down as well as open it up. Mm -hmm infiltrate into it. That's basically what happens. So YHVH moves sovereignly upon her and opens a womb. She conceives. But YHVH didn't take into consideration the Luciferian influence when this happened. That's why we read uh, <coughs> what we're reading now. And the children struggle together within her and she said, if it be so, in other words, if I have, an, uh, a, a, if I have a son, an, a, an heir that's been promised, why am I having this problem? <clears throat> why am I thus? And she went to inquire of the Lord. 
The Lord said unto her, Two nations are in thy womb. Two nations. This is a two people. This is two nations. Goi. Groups. Are in thy womb. So what's happening here is when her womb was opened up, two groups in the spiritual realm have access now into the human race. And then they go on to explain what this is all about. Two nations are in thy womb, and two manner of people shall be separated from thy bowels. And the one people shall be stronger than the other people, and the other shall serve the younger. <coughs> So what's being said here, you have two alien intelligences. That's why they're struggling. They hate each other. There is a friction taking place inside this poor woman, and she can't understand what's going on. But it's because it's a very cosmic uh, 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 comprehension. Yes. So we see it's the Lord God that opens the womb. Okay. But there doesn't seem to be anything making sure what comes forth is going to be from Elohim. There isn't. There isn't a process of okay. We need a. If we're going to you know do this, we need high quality. So how does who makes the decision on on the on the nation child, child babies that come in? Y H. Okay. He's the uh, guardian. Now what okay. he did, he opened a womb so the air could come through. But the Luciferians are constantly running circles around him. He didn't take into consideration that Luciferian would incarnate along with the air. Just like when he does something, he lets Cain go because he has mercy on Cain. But Luciferians took advantage of that and ran circles around. It's been happening throughout the scripture. All because he didn't speak to the Lord. All because he thought he understood he had a handle on it. Right. But he didn't. Until he didn't it went south. However, it having late. said that, should we recognize that since the Father and the Son know the beginning and the end and everything that he's going to do, he, White Trees, can do, the Father's master plan calls for corruption on the earth. So there has to be a certain amount of allowing the Luciferians through that matrix in the first place. Otherwise... Let me... Let me... Okay, okay, all right. That's where you got. All right, address okay, that. Okay, all right. I'm excited. I'm sorry. <laughs> yes, Elohim knew that YHVH was going to not cover this base. He saw it in eternity. And he made a decision on the two. We'll actually we'll come to that a little okay. later on. Yeah, uh, uh, Elohim has has it all covered. He does it. Yes, absolutely. he allows it to take place because it's going to fit into his master plan. <clears throat> which brings us to the next principle. Scripture teaches God incarnates his people into the human race and Satan incarnates his people into the human race. Turn to Jeremiah, first chapter, verse 4 to 5. Then the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. Before I formed thee in the belly, Elohim incarnates his people into the human race. YHVH incarnates his people into the human race. Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. Before thou camest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee. And I ordained thee a prophet unto the nations. Elohim covers all the bases. When Prototokos comes into this world, he has within him everything that he needs to qualify for the fullness of sonship. The talents, the gifts, the calling. All he has to do is pursue 
the knowledge which the Holy Spirit will give him if he allows the Holy Spirit to do that. So we see God incarnates his people. Satan incarnates his people. Turn to Matthew 13, verse 36 to 38. Jesus has sp uh, spoken a parable which the disciples don't quite understand and then he's going to go and explain it to them. Matthew 13, starting in verse 36. Then Jesus sent the multitude away and went into the house and his disciples came unto him saying, Declare unto us the parable of the tares of the field. <clears throat> he answered and said unto them, <coughs> He that soweth the good seed is the son of man. We just read that in Jeremiah. God incarnates his people into the human race. He that soweth the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world. They're incarnating in the human race into the world. <clears throat> the good seed are the children of the kingdom. But the tares <coughs> are the children of the wicked one. <coughs> the enemy that sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the world. The reapers are the angels. So he's talking about the two that have theirs incarnate into the human race. Turn to the Gospel of John, the 8th chapter. John, the eighth chapter, verse 44. <clears throat> ye are of your father the devil, and the lust of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning and abode not in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own for he is a liar and the father of it. So he's telling them plainly, your tares. You are incarnate into the human race through your father, the devil. And actually, verse 42, he says, Jesus said unto him, If God were your father, you would love me. For I proceeded forth, came from God, neither came I of myself, but he sent me. Why do you not understand my speech? Because you cannot hear my word. They're programmed by Satan to not be open or willing to receive the truth. Tares operate the terror is characterized by two things. They operate in lies and they hate the things of God. Now, <clears throat> Scripture teaches Isaac had two sons, Esau and Jacob. Turn to Genesis 25, 24 to 26. We're going to trace the life of these two. And when her days were delivered, when her days to be delivered were fulfilled, behold, there were twins in her womb. And the first came out red all over like an hairy garment, and they called his name Esau. And after that came forth his brother out 
and his hand took hold of Esau's heel, and his name was called Jacob. Esau was three score years old when she bare them. And Jacob was <coughs> Isaac was three score years old. Excuse me, Isaac was three score years old when she bare them. So what we find these two. One is a tear, one is a true Adamic spirit. Yes. Three score is what, 60? Mm -hmm. Yeah. He married him when he was 40. He had his sons when he was 60. So 20 years he was barren. Which brings us to the next principle. Scripture teaches Jacob went on to be the father of the 12 tribes of Israel who had the blessing of the Lord. He had the blessing of YHVH and he had the blessing of Elohim. Turn to Numbers 23, verse 20 to 21. Numbers 23, 20 to 21. Now, <clears throat> Balaam, uh, soothsayer, Gentile prophet is hired to curse Israel. He was on his way when he's intercepted by YHVH and told them not, no uncertain terms as he cursed them because they're blessed. And then he lets them go on and he says, now I'm going to let you speak over them and this is what you're going to say. I'm going to tell you what to say about them. So in verse... Twenty to twenty-one, we read twenty-three. Twenty to twenty-one. Behold, I have received a commandment to bless, and he hath blessed, and I cannot reverse it. So he's talking here about YHVH, that in no uncertain terms let him know that the people of God have already been blessed. Mm -hmm. And there's nothing you can do to reverse that. All you can do is continue to speak blessings upon them. Verse 21, He has not beheld iniquity in Jacob, neither hath he seen perverseness in Israel. The Lord has God is with him, and the shout of a king is among them. So, he's talking here about continuous blessings, favor of God. And that was the case. Israel came forth across the Sinai Desert, wiping out all opposition because the Lord was with him. Everywhere he went was prosperous. He would prosper. Whatever he touched was prosperous because he had the favor of God. Now, what we find here... Conversely, Scripture teaches, even though YHVH blessed Esau, and he, he did, Esau had a blessing too, he was despised by Elohim because of his tear nature. In other words, YHVH <clears throat> had a blessing for him, and he, he, he prospered for a while. But from eternity he was cursed because of Elohim, because he was a tear, and in his heart he hated God and the things of God. And we're going to see this as we progress. Genesis 27, 38 to 40. And Esau said unto his father, Hast thou but one blessing, my father? Bless me, even me also, O my father. And Esau lifted up his voice and wept. And Isaac his father answered and said unto him, Behold, 
A dwelling shall be the fatness of the earth and of the dew of heaven from above. So he's going to dwell in a place that's prosperous. And by thy sword shalt thou live and shall serve thy brother and it shall come to pass when thou shalt have the dominion that thou shalt break his yoke from thy neck. Uh, he's talking about <clears throat> under da uh, David's time. David uh, conquered Edom. Edomians. Edomians. Yeah, Edomians, yeah, for a time. <clears throat> now, what we find so, sorry, here... So he's talking about his line mm -hmm. will be on the yoke. Yes. Right. Okay. Yes. For a time. But when they come out from underneath that, then they're going to dominate Israel and they're going to uh, make life grievous for Israel. Why? Because they're tears. Mm. Now, we see from the beginning the heart of Esau. Genesis 25 33 and 34. <clears throat> Esau, uh, uh, Jacob is making soup. Esau comes in from the hunt hungry. But he's, uh, he's such a, um, a shyster that he's my, his mindset is, you know, I've been out here for several days. I need something to eat. I'm about ready to faint. Desperate. So, Jacob is the shyster. Yeah. Is that the first use of the term in the Jewish culture? The word Jacob means uh, supplanter. Okay. <laughs> okay. So, yeah, there you Being have it. All right. Yes. Thank you. Verse 30. And Esau said to Jacob, feed me, I pray thee, with that same red pottage, for I am faint. Therefore his name was called Edom. Changed his name. Jacob said, Sell me this day thy birthright. Esau said, Behold, I am at the point to die, and what profit shall this birthright be to me? Jacob said, Swear to me this day, and he swore unto him, and he sold his birthright unto Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau bread and pottage of lentils, and he did eat and drink, and rose up and went his way, Thus Esau despised his birthright. Uh, the things of God a tear will have absolutely no regard for. Turn to Romans. Ninth chapter, verse 11 to 13. For the children, talking about Jacob and Esau, being not yet born, so this is a decision made before they became incarnate, neither having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God, talking about the Father, according to election might stand, not of works, but of him that calleth. It was said unto her, the elder shall serve the younger. As it is written, Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated. The word hated there means despised. So the father from eternity pronounced the judgment on Esau before he even before he had, had even created the human race. But he allowed what happened with Rebecca, with the the two races to incarnate in her womb, one in the Damic, the other a tear race, to come forth to be part of his purpose. Mm. So unless a tear is studying what we're studying, that tear wouldn't know why he hates the father. Or no, the Lord. it's just, just like he instinctive. Does. Yeah. The scribes and the Pharisees were tears. They mm. professed to be religious people, 
but they changed the law, changed the wording. They did just the opposite of what the word was saying because they hated the word of God. Yes. Brother Jones, we know the Father is love personified. Yes. It is, you're, you've explained to me before, I need to hear it again. How is it that pure love can hate anything? The word hate there is detest. It means when you take the word of God that's pure and holy and you look upon it in a vile, detestable way in the sight of God, you become a detestation. Before they were born, they hated them. Yeah. So him knowing what they were going to do. Yeah. yeah. Okay, but that's okay. <clears throat> Tough teaching. Scripture t indicates the nation of Esau's descendants called Edomites and later Idumeans would bring great affliction upon the Israelites. They would cause no end of misery to Israel. And the things that they have done pale into insignificance in comparison to the things that they're going to do to the Israelites in the tribulation period. Where would we find um, Edom? or Idumea today? Jordan region. Okay. So just over the, the river, in other words. All those people down there, Trans yeah. Jordan, where you have the, the, the group that's running Jordan now under King Abdullah are called the Hashemites. Okay. They are not Edomites. But within that, you have the Palestinians, you have these other groups, okay. you have the descendants of these people. Of Israel, right. Matter of fact, the, the, the stuff that's fulminating now against Israel is basically at the hands because of these. Yeah, you can see that. Yeah. First Samuel, First Samuel 21, verse 1. We're going to see some examples of what these, the descendants of Edom were capable of. First Samuel 21, one. David is on the run from Saul. Saul is pursuing him to try to kill him. <clears throat> David goes to a, a town, which is a, a priest city called Nob. What had happened was, <clears throat> the YHVH, you had cities because the priests had no inheritance like the tribes of Israel. Uh, the priests came from the tribe of Levi <clears throat> and they were told they would not have a land inheritance like uh, um, Judah and uh, Benjamin and the rest of them. You had, they had plots of land that were their inheritance. The Levites was spread throughout the tribes because they were the, the ministers. They had to minister to the people, to the other tribes, the things of God. So you would have a temple, you would have a, a, a altars where the Levites would um, minister. But they had cities, uh, Levite cities, where they were just priests that right. lived. <clears throat> With that in mind, so it says, Then came David to Nob, to Ahimelech the priest, and Ahimelech was afraid at the meeting of David and said unto him, Why art thou come alone and no man with thee? David said to Ahimelech the priest, The king hath commanded me a business, and it said unto me, Let no man know anything of the business where, whereabout I send thee, and what I have commanded thee, and I have appointed my servants to such and such a place. So David gives them a story. Now Ahimelech is totally... Uh, ignorant of what's taking place. He doesn't know that Saul's out to try to kill David, that Saul's running him off, uh, and that he's uh, out there uh, trying to locate him. All he knows is the David that slew Goliath and the David that was loyal to King Saul, and that's the way he saw David. Now drop down to verse 6. Same chapter, 21 verse 6. So the priest gave him hallowed bread, 
there was no bread there but the show bread that was taken from before the Lord to put hot bread in the, the day when it was taken away. <clears throat> so David is hungry. He's got his men with him. They haven't eaten for days. That's why he goes to this priest's city to see if they can give him you know, uh, uh, things to sustain him. The priest gives him bread for all his men. Now notice what it says in verse 7. Now a certain man of the servants of Saul was there that day detained before the Lord and his name was Doeg an Edomite so he's the descendant of Esau the chiefest of the herdsmen that belonged to Saul so Doeg was in the service of Saul he had a authority to do certain things he happened to be in Nob at that time and he saw David confirmed with the priest and what the priest did now Drop down 1 Samuel 22, verses 16 to 19. Doeg goes and tells Saul that David was there and the priest gave him bread. Saul calls Ahimelech to his presence. And he asks him if he's given David bread. And Ahimelech says, yeah, well, why not? He's, he's in your service. He told me that um, he was on an errand for you and um, he was hungry, so I gave him a bread for him and his men. What, what was wrong with that? Saul so would have none of it. Verse 16, the king said, Thou shalt surely die, Ahimelech, thou and all thy father's house. Now, demon-influenced King Saul has pronounced a death sentence upon God's priest. Unheard of. Notice what it goes on to say. The king said unto the footmen that stood about him, Turn and slay the priests of the Lord, because their hand also was with David, and because they knew when he fled and did not show it to me. But the servants of the king would not put forth their hand to fall upon the priests of the Lord. They knew better. Hmm. Are you kidding? I'm going to kill a priest of God? None of, none of the Israelites would do that. But, 18, the king said to Doeg, the Edomite, turn thou and fall upon the priests. And Doeg, the Edomite, turned and fell upon the priests and slew on that day Four score and five, 85 priests, persons that did wear the linen ephod. And Nob, the city of the priests, smote he with the edge of the sword, both men and women, children and sucklings, and oxen and asses and sheep with the edge of the sword. He wiped out the whole city. One of Ahimelech's sons escaped and goes and tells David. So... Saul must have understood the either the terror influence or the fact that, were, that uh, Doeg is an Edomite. Sure, he knew. Why didn't he ask him first then? Why did he call, t <coughs> because tell him he, Because his, his authority as the king, he would order his own men to do it. What I'm saying to you is, if he knows that there is bad blood, let's say, between Edomians and uh, Israelis. Why would Saul not ask Doeg immediately? Instead of asking his own people, go and kill the priest, why wouldn't he just say to Doeg, go and kill the priest? Because, again, the man is under a demon influence. Okay. To him, it's right for his men to kill the priest because the priest okay. had disobeyed the king. Okay. To him, it's capital punishment. And when you pronounce the sentence on Ahimelech, because you did this, you're a traitor to the throne of right. Israel. Right. Therefore, you are going to die. Okay. So he says, uh, Chris, go and wipe him out. Chris says, are you crazy? <laughs> I'm not going to lift my hand against God's anointed. But he, then knew, he, goes, he knew that Doeg would definitely do it. Oh, sure, sure. Doeg didn't have any hesitation at all. Didn't mm. need any encouragement. He just... Totally put himself into the whole effort. 
So we see that the mindset of the descendants of Esau is totally contrary to yes. God. They stand in opposition to everything God stands for. Matthew, second chapter, verse 16. Now this is all the way down to the era of the Lord. The Idumeans, descendants of Esau, have not changed. Matthew, second chapter, here we have King Herod. Wise men have visited him to find out where the Savior is because they've seen a star in the east. And to them, you know, this is um, an announcement that uh, the Messiah is coming. He expects all Israel to be, you know, jubilant about wanting to... Uh, uh, <coughs> find out where the Messiah is. Wrong. Matthew 2, verses 16 to 18. Then Herod, when he saw that he was mocked, the wise men <coughs> go worship the child. They have a dream. The angel tells them they'll go back that way, go the other way. Herod finds out. Then Herod, when he saw that he was mocked of the wise men, was exceeding wroth and sent forth and slew all the children that were in Bethlehem and in all the coasts thereof from two years old and under according to the time which he had diligently acquired of the wise men. Then was fulfilled that which was spoken by Jeremy the prophet saying in Ramah there was a voice heard lamentation and weeping and great mourning Rachel weeping for her children it would not be comforted because they were not. Now here's a man that did not hesitate to wipe out two-year-old children and babies. An Idumean, an Edomite. <coughs> um, the things of God. The Messiah. He wanted to kill the Messiah. Son of God. Mm -hmm. Which proves that he, he knew full well exactly who he was. Sure. Yeah. Which brings us to the next principle. This is a nation of tares. I believe there are some Adamics probably born into it, but for the most part, they're tares. Mm -hmm. Scripture teaches the land of Idumea, Edom, and its people shall be erased from the earth and become a part of the torment regions of eternity. Turn to Isaiah 34, verses 5 to 10. Isaiah 34, verses 5 to 10. For my sword shall be bathed in heaven. Behold, it shall come down upon Idumea. That's the capital of um, Edom. Uh, that's the nation of Edom. The capital is um, a place called Basra. <clears throat> it shall come down upon Idumea and upon the people of my curse, the Idumeans the uh, Edomites to judgment the sword of the Lord is filled with blood and is made fat with the fatness and with the blood of lambs and of goats and with the fat of kidneys of rams for the Lord hath a sacrifice in Basra that's the capital of Idumea and a great slaughter in the land of Idumea and the unicorn shall come down with them and the bullocks and the bulls and their land shall be soaked with blood and their dust made fat with fatness for it is the day of the Lord's vengeance in the year of recompense for the controversy of Zion in other words for the right way they have treated Israel his people 
And the streams, the word streams there are rivers. The streams thereof shall be turned into pitch, and the dust thereof into brimstone. <clears throat> and the land thereof shall become burning pitch. So he's talking about the waters of Idumea are all going to be turned to burning tar. When does this happen? This, is hap this happens at the end of the tribulation period. Okay. So at the beginning of sorrows, to these tares, because there's going to be a certain number of tares, if not many tares, mm -hmm. who are in the judgment and will die there and then, uh, Jeremiah 25, 30, 33. Mm -hmm. At their death, do they comprehend that the reason for their death is because they are tares? Oh, sure, because the Lord will speak of judgment. Mm. Jeremiah 25, 30. They'll know. Right. But they're going to be survivors that will go on to do worse things Which will be the to ones Israel. You're referring yeah. to. Yes. These are the ones that are going to undergo right. this judgment. And uh, it goes on to say, It shall not be quenched, night nor day. The smoke thereof shall go up forever. From generation to generation it shall be waste. None shall pass through forever and ever. So it's talking about the generation of the Idumeans in their land is going to be turned into hell. Literally, for eternity. Imagine not knowing that a person is a member of a race, a nation, who is coming against Israel. It's already been the judgment's already been spoken out against. Them. They have no idea about this. They're lining up. We've got our tanks and this. They're having no concept. That's crazy. Just crazy. Well, it's because they choose to be ignorant. Hey, look, Jesus is talking to them about their origin. Yeah. And they're standing in opposition. Oh, you don't know what you're talking about. We are children of God. On and on and on and on and on. They refuse to receive the truth. They have the ability to receive the truth. Jesus said, you will not come to me. Not that you can't come to me. You won't come to me that you might have life. Yes. <clears throat> so as you're saying this, it says they have a, a birthright, Mr. Jones. So that's why they are Abraham's people now. They don't serve Abraham. They don't do what Abraham does. But because they are born at a certain place, they think we're, we're Abraham's children. So, therefore, we, we are the uh, the chosen. Is that? It's that way all over the world. In the Christian circles, you have a tear that will enter in surreptitiously and will usurp authority. And in his own mind, he is the genuine authority to say what he says, do what he does, uh, destroy, make people's lives miserable because that's his right. Klaus Schwab and the rest of these guys, yep. they're tears. Yep. They think they have the right <clears throat> to take the human race and obliterate the majority of it and the rest of it conform to their, <clears throat> their pattern, their plan, their way of doing things. That's the mindset of a tear. So Mr. Jones, currently in these days that we still, that we're living, I hear, I hear Fox News mm -hmm. talking about God, praying, and I don't hear Jesus, but I hear God. Now, there's good, the day is just around the corner where God won't even be mentioned. Sure. No, there'll be nothing, no prayers, nothing's gonna happen. But I'm just, I'm enjoying hearing they're including God in, in sentences now. But I know it's, it's, it's just around the corner where they're, they're going to cut that out. Well, God, the, the God that we know is going to be cut out. But you're going to have a substitute, the gods. Uh, yeah, the beast is going to call himself God. Mm. He's going to step in to the place of the Father and announce that he is the end all, the be all of all. Worship me, I am God. Sure. Mr. Smith made a point here, and that is the truth of all this should be when you hear the name Jesus. Because if you say God, a Muslim, a Shinto, <clears throat> um, 
Greek Orthodox, Catholic, they don't feel slighted. Sure. But if you say the name Jesus, and you're cutting it to the core here, and people are <laughs> going to start getting offended. <laughs> anyway, so this is what we find. The tares, <coughs> a race, alien race, that have infected the human race are going to be totally eliminated <coughs> from the face of the earth forever, along with all other alien intelligences. During the millennial period, nothing will be allowed to incarnate but pure Adamic spirits. 